How's it going, guys? High yield vasculitis, thrombophlebitis presentation. So, vasculitity is a fancy word that means plural for vasculitis, but it shows up. You got to just improve your vocabulary. Don't know what to tell you. So, Wegener. So, Wegener granulomatosis, the new name is technically granulomatosis with polyangiitis. It's not also known as. It's low IQ. It's stupid. It's cumbersome, but that's what they did. All right. So, but it's important because feedback I've received is OMG, they'll give you a basic vignette of Wegener granulomatosis and Yosemite, and then the answer is polyangiitis. Holy shit. Okay, so you got to know the terminology. Now, I'll make this real clean and easy for you. Wegener, 100% of vignettes on Yosemite is going to be hematuria, hemoptysis, and headitis, I colloquially refer to it as, because you're going to have any problem with the head, nasal septal perforation, otitis, sinusitis, mastoiditis, okay? So you're going to get this triad on USMLA. It's very straightforward, very easy. And I don't talk about it in this presentation, but real quick tangentially, uh, this condition is often confused with good pasture. Uh, the way you differentiate, because good pasture might be a male, 20s to 40s, was hematuria and hemoptysis, but you don't get headitis in good pasture. Good pasture is your autoantibodies against uh, GBM, glomerular base membrane type 4 collagen. But Wegener, granulomatosis with polyangiitis in contrast, you're going to have C anca and antiprotonase 3 antibodies. Don't have to worry about bullshit mechanisms, just memorize, literally. So C anca, antiprotonase 3, they can give you one or the other. So, um, gotta know it. Now, in terms of the renal stuff, vasculitides, Wegener, microscopic polyangiitis, and I'll talk about the latter as we move through, and good pasture, which is not a vasculitis, but these three conditions can cause rapidly progressive glomerular nephritis, where you get fibrin crescents on biopsy, okay? And they can use the words necrotizing glomerular nephritis in the setting of Wegener. That can be an answer choice uh, for path questions. Like, we'll give you an easy vignette of hematuria, hemoptysis, Headitis, and then they'll say which the following could be seen in this patient, and the answer is necrotizing glomerulonephritis. Churg Strauss, okay, the new name, uh, eosinophilic granulomatosis with polyangiitis. So you're going to get asthma plus eosinophilia. That's how it presents, plus or minus headitis. Okay, so where it can get a little bit annoying is when you try to pigeonhole these conditions because you can't. There, there is an overlap of. Uh, symptomatology slash features. So for example, you could get asthma, eosinophilia, nasal septal perforation. You're like, but that's weird. I thought headitis was Wegener. You're right. It is Wegener, but clearly asthma and eosinophilia is Churg Strauss, not Wegener. So you have to have a little bit of flexibility when you're learning about these vasculitides. Uh, but headitis, maybe only about 50% of, uh, questions for uh, Churg Strauss, whereas you'll see it in basically all Wegener questions, and renal involvement rare for Churg Strauss. So in contrast to Wegener, you're going to get P anca and antimyeloperoxidase antibodies. Okay, so Wegener, we said was C anca and antiprotonase 3 antibodies. Just have to memorize. You say, well, how am I going to memorize? Like, how am I going to do this better? Do you have any special mnemonics? I mean, not really. Um, maybe CPR. Okay, so when we go back to Wegener for a second, C, proteinase, 3, anti-PR, right? So, proteinase 3, yeah, CPR, you can remember is Wegener. It's fucking stupid, I don't really know what to tell you, but some of you want those mnemonics. Microscopic polyangiitis, okay, so this one is pretty easy. This is just going to be hematuria in a patient who's pianca anti-myeloperoxidase positive. Okay, so if they were to give you, let's say, uh, a vignette where there's hematuria, hemoptysis, and there's pianca, no other findings, that's still microscopic polyangiitis. You say, oh, I thought it was like usually just hematuria. Well, you have to eliminate to get there. You have to discern these things out because clearly if it's pianca, it can't be Wegener. If it's P. Anka, it's not uh, good pasture because we said that was anti-GBM. Clearly, it's not Churg Strauss because Churg Strauss is asthma and eosinophilia. So you have to have some flexibility, as I already said. Okay, 
I don't think I've seen a headitis question with nasal septal perforation, mastoiditis, sinusitis, otitis. I haven't seen that uh, for microscopic pharyngitis. It tends to be a bit more mild, but it can cause the renal phenomena. That's basically all you get for microscopic pharyngitis. Now, there's something obscure called mononeuritis multiplex, which I'm going to tell you about because you'll see it in vignettes for Wegener, Churg Strauss, and microscopic pharyngitis, and it can cause confusion. Okay, it's my observation if I do these questions with students well, where they can give you, let's say, uh, microscopic pharyngitis, there's hematuria and there's a foot drop, or they'll give you Wegener where there's hematuria, hemoptysis, nasal septal perforation, and a wrist drop. And the student's like, what's going on with like the neuropathy there? It's called mononeuritis multiplex. For whatever fucking reason, you can get it as part of these vasculitides. So probably inflammation of the vasculature causing damage to nerves. Okay, so um, mononeuritis multiplex, so one large nerve such as uh, the radial nerve causing wrist drop or the common peroneal nerve co causing foot drop in sometimes in multiple locations in the same patient. Okay, so a patient may have a wrist drop, foot drop at the same time. The vignette will just give you one basically. Polyuritis and dose of pan. So it's a medium vessel vasculitis and you can get this string of pearls appearance on renal vessels when you do renal angiogram. So you just got to know that this is a buzzy image for you similarly. I don't cover it in this presentation, but fibromuscular dysplasia, which is uh, hyperplasia, despite the name dysplasia, it's hyperplasia of the tunica media of vessels, especially the renal vessels, which can lead to hypertension in young women. It's a differential for renal artery stenosis, but you can also get uh, an abnormal renal angiogram, which I have in my PDFs. But when you look at this string of pearls appearance here, very buzzy for polyarteritis stenosis, and you need to know fibrinoid necrosis. I talk about this in my PATH PDF, okay? When you look at the different types of necrosis, fibrinoid necrosis. So OID means looks like, but ain't. So marfanoid body habitus, such as in men 2 b or homocystinuria, looks like Marfan syndrome, but it ain't Marfan syndrome, okay? You could also have Waldenstrom macroglobulinemia, where you have plasma cytoid cells, where they look like plasma cells, but they ain't plasma cells, okay? So fibrinoid necrosis, it looks like fibrin, but it ain't fibrin. And you need to know the descriptor. Segmental ischemic necrosis can be seen on biopsy. So the same way when we talked about Wegener, that you could have uh, necrotizing glomerulonephritis as an answer for path questions. You could get polyuricidosa. They show you this very buzzy image here and they say, which the following most likely to be seen in this patient. The answer could be fibrinoid necrosis. The answer could be segmental ischemic necrosis. Okay. Now, probably the highest yield point for polyuricidosa is that it's a perineoplastic of hepatitis B. It doesn't mean that every patient who has PAN has hepatitis B, but 30% with PAN are seropositive for hepatitis B. So for whatever fucking reason, hepatitis B can cause PAN. You say, why? No fucking idea. It's like saying, why does small cell carcinoma secrete antibodies against presynaptic calcium channels causing lambert eaton syndrome? Why does it secrete ADH causing SIDH or ACTH causing Cushing, right? So why do we have cancers that do certain things? Why do we have autoimmune diseases or in this case infection specifically causing pan great fucking question okay but hepatitis b can cause pan it's a factoid you should be aware of and then another weird factoid is that it doesn't affect the lungs okay so it sounds a little bit nitpicky but occasionally especially on 2ck level questions which can be longer and more difficult they might give you a question on vasculitis where they say something about the lungs being affected and you're like cool not PAN. Okay, so talk about osteoarteritis, extremely overrated condition. I think there's only one NBME question floating out there, floating around out there. Why am I mentioning it then? Because it's an elephant in the room. You need to know it as a differential. So it's AK pulsus disease, classically Asian women, and it's large vessel. So it, it'll cause ascending aortitis. Okay, so uh, that's one thing. And also it affects the subclavians, which go to the arms, which is why you can get um, weak pulses or non-palpable pulses. Okay. So just know that it exists. Temporal arteritis, exceedingly high yield for usimily, ultra pass level, aka giant cell arteritis. And nine out of 10 questions, it'll be unilateral. And it's going to be a patient over 50. Okay. That's very buzzy. There's one 2CK question 
or it's bilateral, holy shit. It's weird when you first see the question, you're like, why the hell is it bilateral? Great question, okay? I'm just letting you know it's possible. And it's an autoimmune disease, idiopathic. So it's not unique to temporal arteritis, but in, in general, autoimmune flares, SLE, IBD, RA, you can occasionally get a low-grade fever, high ESR. I've talked about this in my other presentations and YouTube clips. It's called SIR, Systemic Inflammatory Response Syndrome, where you don't have to have an infection, but occasionally... Uh, when there's stress in the body, you can have elevation of temperature. So you can see that notably in temporal arteritis questions, as per my observation, where the patient might have a temperature of 100.5 low grade, and you're like, why is there an elevation of temperature? It's just something you can see with SIRS and autoimmune conditions. So temporal arteritis is associated systemically with polymyalgia rheumatica. They're considered to be on the same spectrum. The question need not give you both at the same time, and they often won't. I'd say maybe only 25 to 33% of questions will give you them at the same time. But if they give you a 55-year-old woman who has a very uh, bad temporal headache and you're thinking, okay, it's temporal arteritis, and yet they tell you ESR is elevated and there's a low-grade fever and there's jaw claudication, which I'll talk about, that you can get pain in the jaw uh, when chewing associated with temporal arteritis. And then they also tell you that there's pain in the hips and shoulders and that uh, systemic finding in terms of affecting proximal muscles, the pain and stiffness, that's polymyalgia rheumatica. I don't want to do a lengthy fucking tangential discussion right now, but you could be aware that polymyositis, unrelated, the way you differentiate that from polymyalgia rheumatica is polymyositis will have either an increased creatine kinase and or weakness on physical exam, must be physical exam. You'll get one or both of those findings, increased CK and or weakness in physical exam in polymyositis, whereas in polymyalgia rheumatica, you don't, okay? And then a uh, highest yield point for temporal arteritis, apart from just knowing the diagnosis, is that you're going to do steroids before biopsy to prevent blindness. The NBME can write it as you're preventing ischemic optic neuropathy. I've seen that one, the NBMEs. And... IV methylprednisolone is how they can write the answer for steroids. So there are some things that they care about route of administration of steroids. And in other words, oral prednisone is basically not going to be the answer. Like you could give it, but I'm just telling you, IV methylprednisolone, you have to be able to identify as very buzzy and a pass level steroid. Okay. I mean, that's what you tend to give. We also give IV methylprednisolone over oral prednisone in the setting of acute asthma attack. Okay in multiple sclerosis. And then something I'll point out is when we do steroids before biopsy, the US simile can be varied in terms of time frames. So they can give you weird answers like IV methyl methylprednisolone now, biopsy within a week, or biopsy within three days, and students memorizing different time frames. They don't give a fuck, okay? You just need to know steroids first, then biopsy. And then I'm letting you know that there's an audacious question on one of the uh, the neuroforms for 2CK where they say, they give you easy vignette of temporal arteritis, say, what's the next best step in diagnosis? The answer is biopsy, steroids aren't listed. And it's just, just a little bit audacious because we're very programmed to, to be like, okay, don't choose biopsy first, it's wrong. Like choose steroids first. You must choose steroids first, prevent blindness, then do biopsy. But they're talking about next best step in diagnosis. It's clearly you're going to do biopsy. Steroids aren't going to be a diagnostic step. Berger disease, okay, you can pronounce it burger, doesn't fucking matter, but uh, aka thromboangiitis obliterans, very buzzy, passable presentation of a male who is a heavy smoker who's going to have gangrene of the fingers or toes. And they might say the patient's not diabetic, okay? So diabetes is a big uh, risk factor for gangrene of the toes, uh, but if the patient doesn't have diabetes especially and they give you heavy smoker, that's going to be thromboangiitis obliterans and they just want smoking cessation as the answer. And then I just quickly mentioned don't confuse with uh, burger disease without the U, which is IgA nephropathy. That's a viral infection uh, followed by hematuria one to three days later. Okay, so sore throat in a 12-year-old followed by red urine one to three days later. That's IgA nephropathy. Sore throat in a 12-year-old followed by red urine one to three weeks later. That's post-treptococcal glomerulonephritis. Talk about all that stuff in my renal PDF. Okay, so sending aortitis, uh, syphilitic aortitis. So sending aortitis, you mentioned for Takayasu arteritis, actually, but I'm mentioning this for syphilis, that you have to know that trepanema pallidum, it's a spirochete, 
It can invade the vasa vasorum, which are small vessels that supply the walls, the thick walls of the aorta itself. And you can get what's called endarteritis plus obliteration, that phrase, endarteritis plus obliteration. So invasion of the vasa vasorum, you destroy the inner lining of the aorta and you get obliteration of the vasa vasorum. So tree barking, okay, so you gotta know it's possible. Phlebitis means inflammation of the vein, thrombophlebitis, inflammation of the vein due to thrombosis, okay? And then DVT, so you're going to have a clot within the femoral vein, and it can cause a very painful leg. And big risk factors, okay? Patients who are post-op, so they're sedentary, not moving. It's important to ambulate uh, immediately after surgery. They, they can turn it into a, a population health type of question, Okay, where, you know, safety science, where they say patient gets a DVT and they say like, which the following would have prevented this. And it's like early ambulation, right? Easy answers like that. Prolonged sedentation, OCPU. So uh, I, should, I should have written combined OCPU. So, okay, so estrogen, which I'll talk about uh, as we move through, but estrogen uh, containing oral contraceptives increase the risk for clots. Okay, so estrogen upregulates fibrinogen, also factors five and eight. And then it's sort of self-explanatory thrombotic disorders like factor V Leiden that's activated protein C resistance um, and prothrombin mutation. Just those can cause clots, of course. And then Verkhoff triad spelled Verk for cow. So hypercoagulability, stasis, endothelial damage. It's very buzzy. It's something you just got to be aware of uh, when you're looking at vignettes in terms of thromb thrombosis formation. You need not have all three, but they can give you, uh, for example, for example, superior mesenteric uh, venous thrombosis. I've seen as an answer for a question. I've talked about this in my PDFs in a patient who has cirrhosis and lung cancer. And in terms of eliminating to get there, you know, we we can I can ask the student. I say, well, what are the patient's risk factors? I say, well, there's cirrhosis. That's going to be a backup. That's stasis. Okay, and then because the mesenteric veins merge with the splenic to go to the portal, which goes to the liver. So you have a backup that's stasis. Lung cancer, that's malignancy, that's hypercoagulable state, right? So that's how we can get uh, venous thrombosis in that case. Smoking, endothelial damage, a little bit weird, uh, but in terms of which one uh, smoking augments, is it hypercoagulable state or is it endothelial damage? Literature says both, but just got to know that that's how smoking can factor in increased risk. And then smokers over 35, you're not, this is family medicine, but you're not going to give combined OCPs to these women. All right. Under 35, you got to use your best judgment. And, but on US Simile, they'll make you a 37 year old woman who smokes a pack a day and you're not going to give her estrogen containing contraceptives. You can give her a uh, progesterone only contraceptive pill, the mini pill, uh, or she can have intrauterine device that's progesterone only, but you're not going to give her the estrogen containing one. Estrogen upregulates fibrinogen, upregulates factors five and eight. A. okay. That's why it's hypercoagulable. And it's a lot we can talk about, but that's also why, uh, for hormone replacement therapy in postmenopausal women, uh, that there's increased risk of thromboses as well. because that effective estrogen. So you assimilate likes nephrotic syndrome as a cause of not just DVT, but also superficial thrombophlebitis, which I'll talk about, and also renal vein thrombosis. Okay, so antithrombin-3 is a protein. You lose it in the urine, and they can tell you that um, there's a thrombosis in the renal vein. They can tell you the patient has a painful cord, which is your a painful superficial vein at the ankle, superficial thrombophlebitis, where they can give you a DVT. And you just have to be able to link that to antithrombin-3 deficiency. It's one of the two ways antithrombin-3 deficiency presents in U.S. simile. I'd say this nephrotic syndrome is four out of five questions. One out of five questions, it's actually a hereditary disorder. And there's one question on one of the surgery forms for 2CK where they just give you a 22-year-old male uh, who just has idiopathic thromboses, and that's antithrombin-3 deficiency. So antiphospholipid syndrome, this is a difficult diagnosis um, when you're first learning material because there's a lot of weird stuff going on. So the patient's going to have in vitro increase in partial thromboplastin time. So it's going to look like if your PTT is fucked up and it's elevated, you would think logically that you'd have bleeding diathesis, meaning 
increased propensity to bleed, such as hemophilia, right? You get an isolated increase in PTT. You say, well, there's too much bleeding. So why the fuck do we get in vivo thrombosis, however? That's like the opposite. That's paradoxical. It's because antibi antibodies against phospholipid can cause platelet clumping, apparently, which can lead to increased initiation of clotting and thrombosis. Okay, so it's a little bit weird, but what they'll do, it's not hard to diagnose. Like they'll just say patient has increased PTT to 25 to 40 seconds normal. And they give you PTT of 48 seconds and the patient has thrombosis. Okay, not dramatic. Antiphospholipid syndrome, you can see in SLE. Okay, they call it lupus anticoagulant. And you can also get false positive syphilis tests. Okay, VDRL, RPR, false positive syphilis tests and antiphospholipid syndrome. So a uh, major danger, of course, of DVT is that it can embolize the lungs, causing a pulmonary embolism. So patient has a swollen, sore leg after surgery, and then shortness of breath, tachycardia. Okay, so that's uh, just obviously the etiology for PE, a DVT that's launched off. And then our first step in diagnosis is going to be duplex ultrasound, exceedingly high yield. Holman sign, low yield for you, I'm just mentioning it here. Um, because it's something you can be aware of that if you dorsiflex the foot and you get pain in the calf, it's not ultra sensitive or specific, but it can be associated and treatment is heparin. They can have subcutaneous anoxaparin as the answer on the eosimile. And then you can be aware of obviously 2CK3 stuff is that, um, there's prophylactic dose and then there's therapeutic dose. So patients who have venous insufficiency, varicose veins, history of valvular, venous valvular incompetence in the legs with skin changes, stasis dermatitis, post phlebitic syndrome. Patients who are at risk, they can get prophylactic dose of heparin, which is an answer on one of the forms for surgery, where choice B, where therapeutic do dose choice C is wrong. Therapeutic dose would be the patient right now as a DVT, or the patient right now as a superficial thalamophobitis, which I'll talk about. But if the patient doesn't have an active DVT, just they they just tell you ultrasound of the legs show occlusions, but so it's risk factor for DVT. Okay, if you get further occlusion or rupture a rupture of a thrombus, um, then you'd give therapeutic dose for the DVT for thrombus. But for just uh, venous disease, we give prophylactic dose now. Um, yeah, as I just said, I, I mentioned this first question here about prophylactic dose, a uh, patient going into surgery who's got risk factors, but we don't give a therapeutic dose right away. We only do that for the DVT, superficial alphabetics. And then there's also a weird fucking question out there where they tell you a patient is already on prophylactic heparin for surgery, and then the patient gets a DVT anyway, and the answer is heparin. Okay, and then the student's like, what the fuck? It's because you got to give, you got to up the dose to therapeutic dose heparin. Okay. So that's something you got to be aware of. And then it's dumb, but there's something called paradoxical embolus where if you have an uh, atrial septal defect, it can sometimes be uh, VSD, but usually ASD where that allows for a clot to go from the venous circulation to the right atrium and then through to the left atrium and then up to the brain causing stroke. Okay, so that's possible if the patient gets, has a DVT followed by stroke, because otherwise that clot is gonna go from the femoral vein to the, the lungs, the pulmonary artery is causing pulmonary embolism, not uh, a stroke. Superficial thalamophobitis is important for 2CK level stuff. I know some of you are studying for step one, but I mean, gotta ace 2CK eventually. So they'll describe this as a painful, warm, palpable cord at the ankle that may or may not track up to the knee increased risk of venous insufficiency. And then subcutaneous anoxaparin is an important answer. So it's tricky because compression stockings are the answer nine out of 10 times when we talk about just treating venous disease in general. Patient has varicose veins, answer compression stockings. Patient has valvular incompetence, venous, just venous insufficiency, answer compression stockings. So extremely buzzy. But if they give you an active DVT, if they give you an active superficial thalamophobitis, the immediate treatment is subcutaneous anoxaparin. It's giving heparin. The patient should be on compression stockings, yes, but the immediate treatment is subcutaneous anoxaparin. And I haven't seen warm compresses as warm compresses as a, an answer on NBME. Even though you'll read sometimes in resources that you do warm compresses for superficial amplice, haven't fucking seen it asked. Okay, so new NBME material comes out. I'm not talking about cubing. 
Okay, I'm talking about NBME, which is the real US simile. So if NBME material comes out where it's warm compressors, I'll be like, oh, okay. Haven't seen it yet though. So post-op migratory thymophlebitis. So you just gotta know it's a cause of fever, uh, usually two plus days post-op within one day of a uh, sur uh, surgery. Um, uh, atelectasis is the most common cause of post-op fever, okay? But students will memorize exact time frames as far as like, is it two days, five days, et cetera? US somebody doesn't give a fuck. You're gonna get a presentation. You're gonna say, well, this is the presentation of post-op migratory thymophlebitis, which they might say that there's red painful areas on the arms. You're like, that sounds a little bit weird. Okay, well, it's five days post-op. The patient has a low-grade fever, and that sounds like migratory thymophlebitis. Okay, so it's just something you got to be aware of. And then Trucio sign of malignancy. This is important, especially for pancreatic cancer, uh, where uh, you can have liberation slash secretion of tissue factor, factor three, which can uh, stimulate the clotting cascade. Okay, it's not limited to the pancreas, but you can get it with pulmonary adenocarcinoma, but if you look this up, it's very buzzy that it happens to be pancreatic adenocarcinoma. So trucio sign of malignancy, where if a patient, let's say, has jaundice, history of smoking, jaundice, increased uh, ALP and direct bilirubin, which is self-explanatory if you have jaundice. Well, not necessarily self-explanatory. You could have a uh, indirect hyperbilirubinemia. But my point is, the patient, let's say, is jaundiced, smoker, increased direct bilirubin, ALP, which implies common bile duct obstruction from a head of pancreas cancer, and then also has sore red areas, pink areas on the arms, legs, trunk. That's just true of malignancy, okay? Migratory thymophlebitis. And then I just point out, don't confuse a Troisier sign of malignancy, which is a palpable left supraclavicular lymph node, aka Verkhoff node, spelled Verkau, which is a sign of visceral malignancy, often gastric, but it can be other cancers like ovarian, pancreatic. Okay, I've also seen it for Hodgkin lymphoma on a 2C can be a me question. And then there's Trucio sign of hypocalcemia, which is going to be carpopedal spasm with inflation of blood pressure cuff. Okay, Chavostek sign of hypocalcemia is twitching of the masseter with palpation. Okay, so catheter-associated septic thymophlebitis. It shows up on an NBME exam for surgery where they just tell you a patient had a catheter in and then develops this indurated painful fluctuant cord. And if you know about superficial thymophlebitis, as we talked about, which is ultra high yield, and you say, well, I know that that's a painful palpable cord at the ankle, and then patients who have catheters in are off, it's going to be in the vein, and they're mentioning a painful palpable cord. That sounds like phlebitis. So it just makes sense. The answer would be a catheter associated phlebitis here. And they have excision of the vein as an answer. Sounds very fucking weird, but you can eliminate to get there. Okay. Like CT scan's not going to be correct. So occasionally you get weird answers, but I'm just letting you know that this shows up. And then there's pelvic septic phlebitis, especially high yield for. Obs gyne questions. Okay, so uh, they'll tell you a woman postpartum and she's got endometritis, so fever, uh, lower abdominal pain within 48 hours. That's how endometritis tends to present. Now, endometritis can be polymicrobial and she'd get antibiotics for that. But let's say there's a persistence of fever beyond 48 hours. Okay, she's been on antibiotics. She has the persistence of fever. You have to think of pelvic septic thymophlebitis. Okay, and this is because endometritis can increase the risk of infected clots uh, in the ovarian veins. So where this can get annoying is that there's another term called pure peril sepsis, which just means sepsis around the time of parturition. And that's a more general term that can include pelvic septic thymophlebitis, but it can also refer to other causes. So there's a there's a 2CK OBS guide question floating around where they don't give you the standard vignette of lower abdominal pain uh, despite antibiotics and persistent fever, they don't give you what sounded like endometritis, but you have a, a woman who had a C-section and nevertheless is septic anyway. And the answer is just pure parosepsis where pelvic septic thrombophlebitis was wrong. Okay. Cause you say it doesn't, didn't sound like it came from endometritis here. So I'm just being technical because it's on the NBME exams. All right, so vasculitis thrombophlebitis, not dramatic. All right. Obviously I'll make more clips and subscribe to the channels. And I appreciate your time. That's it.